coming up on Theater Talk. I get reminded every time uh, for, before a show that it's a first time, only time hearing for that crowd, and you have a mental reminder of how to lay the story out, mm -hmm. you know? And every once in a while, you tweak it. You know, you have something else in mind, and you give it a try, mm -hmm. you know? And uh, Usually when Sam Gold is not there. <laughs> <laughs> Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. Also, here's another thing that bothers me. You don't get angry. Of course I Maybe do. Maybe once you Right angry. now I feel angry. Right now you're angry. You're damn right I am. No, I don't believe that you are angry, that you're in it, that you're inside the feeling of feeling angry. I think you're just outside of it looking at it like, oh, there's some interesting thing. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. Now, Susan, there's a terrific new play on Broadway, A Doll's House Part Two, that, um, Shows us uh, what has happened to Nora in the 15 years <laughs> since she slammed the door on Torvald and went so. out into the world. Uh, the play is by uh, Lucas Nath. Welcome to Theater Talk. Thanks. And it stars the uh, brilliant Laurie Metcalf. Thank you. As Nora and the equally brilliant Chris Cooper as Torvald. Thank you. Sir. Welcome all to Theater Talk. And congratulations on uh, <coughs> Tony nominations. I think you're the triple threat here, I do believe. <laughs> yes, all, uh, your entire cast of four was nominated, and you, and how mm -hmm. and Gold, and yes. mm -hmm. Oh, the dry barrier. All right, so Lucas, what got you thinking about um, the continuation of, of Nora's life? Because I remember years ago, there was a Hal Prince musical. A Doll's Life. Called A Doll's Life, yeah. with George Hearn, and it sort of follows her into the world. There's a, there's a couple of rather obscure sequels to the play, but, um, you know, I, I'm a big Ibsen fan. I love, I, I, I think his, he's, a, he's a master of plot. Mm -hmm. I love how the plays sort of work like this amazing roller coaster ride. So I started off as an Ibsen fan, and then I just sort of, as a joke, told somebody I was going to write A Doll's House Part Two. <laughs> Something about the title, like, made me giggle yeah. and felt a little naughty. And then, and then the joke turned into a real thing when I just started um, playing around with uh, the, the original Ibsen play and tried to figure out where the space is to say more or to continue the conversation. Well, what I thought was fascinating because A Doll's House is a drama, but this play certainly has dramatic elements, but it's very funny. And I admired the way you get away with allowing these 19th century characters to speak in mm. contemporary fashion. Yeah, well, you know, it's interesting. In, in studying Ibsen and studying how it's, his plays are received in Norway, something that I often read is that in Norway, people are laughing riotously at his plays. And is the Neil Simon of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sort of. I mean, there's something about when you have incredibly high stakes and people are being compelled to be honest, that that creates... Um, a kind of uh, comedy. I did think that uh, contemporizing the language would make um, those moments of telling the truth uh, a bit more immediate and therefore funny. So, Lori, where is uh, Nora at this point in her life when, when the part two begins? When, the knock on, when you hear the knock on the door? Fifteen years have passed, and we don't know what she's been up to, but she shows up looking pretty well. Yeah, yeah she so. sure does. Pretty good. She does. You said that you had uh, asked people what they thought would have happened to Nora, and most were negative. Yeah, I pulled um, a lot of people. Speculations, yeah. 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 That she would, she would have failed. She would have. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought that was peculiar, and it made me want to do the exact opposite. So she is a successful, can we give some of it away? Oh, I don't like to give away what has made Nora successful. Right. Because in the writing, Lucas sets it up as a guessing game. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Between right. Nora and Anne-Marie, which is mirroring, I think, what the audience is going I was anticipating also. the worst. <laughs> yes. Even though how she looks? No. Well, this is true, but I thought maybe you had made good money there. Uh, it, it's the worst. But, and I, I want to say that Linda Weiner, the critic, said you were wearing the most beautiful dress she'd ever seen. David the, Zinn, also a Tony nominee. In, in the guessing game, I thought, oh, no, has she, you know, has she fallen? Well, that's what Anne-Marie, well, yeah, Anne-Marie doesn't know what could possibly have mm -hmm. earned uh, mm -hmm. Nora the success. So Anne-Marie is very, very surprised when, when Nora tells her very proudly what she's been up to. And then, of course, there's the wonderful moment where we do not expect Torvald's 
arrival because you haven't seen each other since <laughs> she slammed the door. And no, I must say, the timing, th is, timing is perfect. Tarvald has just done uh, this one particular day. He's forgotten some paperwork. <laughs> and <laughs> made an early arrival home. Yes, but there's a marvelous bit where he doesn't recognize her at first. Yeah, I love I love that yeah. moment. What's going on in his life for these last 15 years? Has he is he the same man he was when she left, or has he moved along? You know. <laughs> We're working on this for, we've been working on this since the second week of October 2016. Wow. And five months may seem like a pretty long time. I, I just feel like we're just getting our feet wet. Really? Yes. Why do you think yeah. that is? Is it because you're now in front of an audience and you have a sense of how they are responding to the play and how they're reacting to the character? I think the pace is so important and it was so driven um, by Sam Gold. Just recently have I have I been given the time uh, settling in here to to really um, think and per and begin and begin to personalize this character. Mm. Just just begun to do that. Does that make the experience more fun for the two of you that you're that you're still working it out? As yeah, it's it's uh, it's really our two scenes that we have together on stage are both very different, um, and I love the point that we get to in the last scene, which is I think unexpected from mm -hmm. the audience. I get reminded every time before a show that it's a first time, only time hearing for that crowd, and you have a mental reminder of how to lay the story out. Mm -hmm. And every once in a while, you tweak it. You know, you have something else in mind, and you give it a try. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, usually when Sam Gold is not there, <laughs> oh, I, think, I, think, not the I think Sam is. Sam was. Sam was extremely encouraging and gave us uh, gave us so much free reign. He gave us the freedom to really find our blocking, find our movement, find. Um, and, and he certainly had an eye of. Yeah, the, the the stage is unusual in that it comes way out beyond the proscenium. The point of a triangle. The point of a triangle. Lucas, how do you describe the setting in before before Sam got to it and came in and with the designer? How did you describe the setting of this play? Yeah, uh, I'm trying to remember what's in the script. There's a little note at the front of the script that says a couple of things. It says that uh, it, you 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 should have as little as possible on stage. Mm -hmm. Um, and the door is prominent. The door is prominent. The setting is a little abstracted mm -hmm. because there's a degree to which I, I'm not interested in the audience reading the play so literally. The moment that you start to create uh, a house that has some, you know, effort towards verisimilitude. With tchotchkes. Yeah, yeah, you start you start having a hypernaturalism of Ibsen. Yeah, and and I, you know, my first stab at writing the play when I very, very beginning was sort of a mock Ibsen play, but there's something about it that felt a little bit like a tribute band. You know, it was a little too cute, a <laughs> little too clever, and I thought, okay, let's strip, the, strip away as much as I can. What I found interesting about it, um, Lori, is you look at the original play, and you are on Nora's side because she has to get out of this suffocating world. But you jump 15 years ahead when this play starts. Her decision had consequences for the other people mm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. that were not necessarily the best things that could happen right. to people. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what Lucas did. Mm -hmm. You know, Nora comes back just full of life and experience. It's been and great for her. Confidence yeah. and, yeah, one little tweak that she's got to make to get right back into the thick of things and how she's running her life the way she wants it. And uh, yeah, and so these things hit her in the face when she comes back and uh, re realize what the time has cost everybody. It struck me that she had taken on the male narcissism that we had seen in Torvald in the Doll's House w w 1. And there was an interesting, not to tell you what you're doing, but you know, it was an interesting mm -hmm. uh, psychological mm -hmm. dynamic suddenly flipping. And it's interesting between her and her grown daughter mm -hmm. now. Of how they're know. looking now, who, who they don't know each other, mm -hmm. but they see ver they're they're on opposite ends of the spectrum with marriage. And yes, and what did she do to this girl? Yes, yep. the abandonment issue. Mm -hmm. You don't expect that coming in this sequel at all. That that mother daughter relationship. In our traditional perception of male female relationships, you would have thought that he would bounce back better. 
I would have thought, from reading the first Doll's House, I would have thought he would bounce back better than you describe. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It, it, it's, it's. No, uh, I don't. I don't. No, I don't, all right. <laughs> well, he had to stay there within that community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Within that community, and and um, take you know what's. I don't think we're giving anything away. Yes, yes. Uh, keep keep Anne Marie as as the uh, ra for raising raising the kids. The boys are the boys are gone, but you know the youngest daughter is, has is still in the household. I think he's kind of brought his daughter up to be a um, very proper, <laughs> it's, it's almost contradictory what I hear coming from Emmy that she's mm, can I, can I, not, yeah. not so interested in books and all that, but a whip smart girl. You know? But he didn't find another wife. That's my point. Um, well, we were provided with a, a, bun a bunch of scholarly Articles about okay. Norway and at the, at that period and women's rights and what was going on with marriage and men's relation and women's relationships. I think he was so concerned. So and and, and this seemed to be a part of that period. What society thought of people at that time was paramount. Mm -hmm. mm. And I looked. Uh, I remember. I was also kind of interested in what was happening religiously in Norway. And is it, what is it, Lutheran? Is it yeah, predominantly yeah. Yeah. Lutheran? And I was, all, I was struck that at that period of time in the church, in the Lutheran religion, they believed that only, the children could only inherit the evil from mothers, from the mothers. Uh, and that was kind of really interesting to me. But um, no, I imagine in a in a in a quiet little um, town, in Norway. Um, well, not a lot he of settled bars in. Back then. <laughs> <Yeah>. Settled in, <laughs> and he is a he's he's not an outgoing man. He's a man of of numbers and money, and um, I just think he found his quiet little niche. You know, and is it in possible, life. Lucas, that he? Because I always thought, saw this in the original play, part, Dallas House Part One, he does love Nora. Yes, and, and I think he still loves Nora in his way. He doesn't understand her, yeah. but he does love her. Well, it, when I started writing what this play, I went and found a really bad translation online, mm -hmm. cut and pasted it into a document, and tried to write the, uh, Ibsen's play in my own words. And I stripped out any of the stuff that we sort of associate very easily with a doll's house. So I stripped out the references to macaroons. I stripped out the uh, my little bird, squirrel, all that stuff. And thank God. When when you take out a lot of these little, I mean, and they're they're absolutely integral bits. But when you take out these things that we sort of very quickly associate with the play, something that became very clear to me is that the marriage between Nora and Helmer, they are two people who are stepping around each other. They don't want to get into a fight. They, they want everything to just be nice and, you know, uh, comfortable. And, and, um, and it's all of that avoiding of the difficult stuff, the mm -hmm. anger, the, it, the, that seemed to me to be the real problem mm -hmm. in this marriage. And so that, made, that created a mandate for the sequel. They need to have it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, no, you do. It's, well, it's a, it's a fascinating play. Like everybody, every, you know, I think we kind of brought up, every, you've, Lucas has so developed points of view. I mean, that's, that's paramount in this, in this script. Each person has, has a valid point of view over, over these, mm -hmm. you know, since Nora has left. And, um, you know, I mean, the, the folks that are coming backstage after the thing saying, well... I, I didn't. Um, I didn't like Torvald in the opening, but I, you know, I learned to, um, you know, see his side of it. Certainly, see the millennials. Certainly, see Emmy's side of it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, there's there's a. I'm sure there's um, a group that totally. I mean, probably a big group that totally sees Anne Marie's. Yes, partner. the middle-aged servant group. We do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Nora's side is still, I'm having a good time in my life. 
Well, but she's got well, her yeah. arguments. She's yeah. still got her strong, yeah, strong her arguments thing. too. Yeah, yeah. And she's uh, she there's a commitment to her, and uh, her fight's not done. You know, absolutely. She's, yeah, she's gonna keep going. She's uh, she's courageous and selfish and funny. It's it's the Nora that we get to see that could we never could have met her had she not gone off and had the experiences that she's had, and now she gets to come back and show the person that she's grown into. Hmm. Gotta That's we're up. out of time. All right. Uh, the play is A Doll's House Part 2 at the Golden Theater, a terrific production starring Laurie Metcalf and Chris Cooper, written by Lucas Nath. Thank you all for being our guests tonight on Theater Talk, and um, good luck on June 11th. After all the problems I've already fixed for you, you want me to fix this too? Is that what you're really saying? F*** you, Nora. <laughs> F*** you. You have zero gratitude. Now, uh, Susan, there was a hugely popular animated movie in the 90s, Anastasia, which you saw when you were a little girl, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right after Pinocchio. Right. <laughs> right. It has been made into a terrific new Broadway musical here in New York at the Broadhurst Theater. It stars Christy Out. <laughs> Altamar, I got it right. Altamare. Altamare, right, as the title character, Anastasia. And Ramin Karimlu, who plays the evil, sort of evil, Gleb yeah. in pursuit of her. Absolutely. And it was written by Terrence McNally, who seems to be on this show every time I turn around. <laughs> Welcome back for I your... I play the good guy. <laughs> Welcome back <laughs> for your... I'm the hero, Roman- romantic lead. That's right. Welcome back for your 10th appearance, Terrence. Um, now, Terrence, years ago when you were on the show... You, had, you told me you had a sign on your desk that says, no more musicals. That's it. And here you are with your, what, 10th musical? How many I, is this one? I don't know how many, but I, I don't think it's 10, but it's getting up there. Is that sign still on the desk, or have you just thrown no, it? No, I took it down. <laughs> but uh, but uh, when Lynn, Steve, Lynn uh, Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty uh, ask if you're interested in working with them again. Because uh, you did ride time with them. Yeah, and uh, I said, well, let me watch. I had not seen the film. Mm. We did Ragtime and Man of No Importance, two shows I'm very, very proud of. Yeah. And uh, I watched the movie, and I saw, I love the score. Mm. And I did remember dimly the Ingrid Bergman movie. Yes, of course, yeah. And I said, I'd, I think this could make a terrific musical, but it's got to be about real people, and we can't have singing animals, <laughs> and it's got to be set in an historical context. Right. People like Lenin and Bolsheviks really existed, yeah. and a family called the Romanovs were executed yeah and there was a rumor that one of them escaped yep. and she wanted to be reunited with her grandmother and all this was very appealing to me because it's a modern fairy tale with real seeds in reality the history of of Europe so I said I'd be very interested and we had a meeting and we started working for it was just about four years ago they called me having uh, delved into the the Romanovs and the history. And we know through DNA that um, Anastasia really, Is, she, she did die. Yeah. But why do you think people have clung to this idea that she escaped for so long? What is appealing about I, it? I think we love good fairy tales, good mysteries. We love stories about people searching for their identity. Mm-hmm. We all have a longing. Who, what were my, who are my, my ancestors? What are my precedents as a person? And there's something very human about wanting to find out who I am. Mm-hmm. I think we've created a modern fairy tale. But also what is a, a historical reality is that this was really an opportunity for some young woman if, in fact, she was turned out to be Anastasia. And, and Chrissy, your character has uh, amnesia, right? Yes, she has amnesia. And at that period in time, you know, in Russia, there was a lot of people destitute fighting to get bread on the streets. And so it is an alluring thing to, oh, maybe grandma will have the answers, you know, and be able to, maybe I'm not this, maybe I'm mm-hmm. not this I'm, poor person. Maybe I'm, I'm not yeah. poor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe, yeah. yeah. And, the, and the number of bodies in the grave of the Romanovs, Anastasia's body was not there. Yes, yes. and this so, was, because now. They learned many years later, yes. 
she was buried 200 yards away in an in another came DNA, pit. and they so there was a real out. basis for these rumors to have started. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Ramin, uh, you're you're the bad guy. <laughs> so they say. <laughs> right. You have that dark bad guy look about you. I must well, you're say, the very fetching. <laughs> well, you represent the communist. Yeah, Deputy Commissioner yes. Gleb Vaganov, yeah. you know, and he must Bolshevik, and he must destroy her because the Romanovs must be wiped out. There can be no rallying point, right? The dilemma is if you are Anast if Anya is Anastasia, how do, what do I do about that? You know, knowing that what we did, well, what my father and his folks. Because your father, what did your father do? He was one of the guards. I was there. Uh, one of the oh, the one of the killers. Yeah. The execution right. squad. He died of shame. He, you know, you kill women and children. Not, you know, point blank. Even right. for them. <laughs> This was not the way to go about it. There's a lot more of this in the in, in the musical than there is in the Dis in, okay, the Disney. It was not a Disney movie. In the cartoon movie. Yeah. Movie. You're showing us both sides yeah. of the issue in this musical. We tried to make it a musical for Broadway. It's, it is indeed. Not an adaptation of either film. And I said to Lynn and Stephen, for example, the movie opens with the most famous song from the film, Journey to the Past. Now it's our Act One curtain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, I think Act One should take place entirely in the repressive society of uh, Leningrad in 1927. And Act Two takes place in the liberated Paris of Picasso, Stravinsky, yes. modern art, jazz, women wearing short skirts. But I do want to say at the beginning of Act One, you do have the fabulous, Ro fabulous oh. Romanov ball with the beautiful beaded costumes. And there was something very seductive about <laughs> yeah. that way of life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You could all daydream about <laughs> yes. living that way. But I do like the fact, though, Terrence, that you... I just could never see you doing a, an animated movie. I couldn't either. That's why I said, if you want a singing bat, there's a famous bat in the movie. <laughs> And I think a chipmunk or two <laughs> might have a number. I said, I'm not your guy. It's a great movie. <laughs> but I don't do chipmunks. <laughs> and they got it. And I said, your villain in the movie is Rasputin. He died six or seven years before the Romanovs were executed. Right, right. So yeah. in my sense of <laughs> history cannot be that. I want people to learn something from the show. Absolutely. Uh, like, oh, yeah, there was... That was the last d dynasty to go down, and the violence of that revolution. And Absolutely. Russia was hermetically sealed yep. from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I just found all this fascinating to write about. You've and been to Russia a couple of times. Did you yeah, ever go I was to only, the site where the Romanovs were I killed? No, no. Uh, that's quite a trip from um, where I was. When you were in the Soviet Union, were you aware of the enduring cult of the Romanovs? Yeah, I was. was still there, even though... I, I was Soviet shocked to, to see to souvenirs out. of the Romanovs being sold, yeah. Mm -hmm. And because this is one, I said, I can't believe that's really this long a line every day and was bitter cold to see Lenin embalmed in that tomb. Yeah. Stood in line for three hours and keep moving, keep moving. So you're in the room, the mausoleum, looking at his body for no more than 60 seconds. Hmm. And I waited three hours just to have that experience. And this is, this was almost, uh, you know, 60 years after the revolution, yeah. 70 years. And people, the cult of Lenin. And that's why he had to be in the show, is, you know, his statue. Yes, oh, no, that's, that's Presence. wonderful. These are real people, and, you know, uh, this I, happened. Could you have imagined such a set? I want to go back no. to your set. The technology. This incredible, of incredible theater. set. But then they, they could realize anything you wrote. You didn't have to be confined by anything. I, I, someone told me really good advice a few years. I wish they told me much earlier. They yeah. said, just write it. Yeah. We'll find a way to stage it. Mm. Yes. I mean, they have a moving train going across I, Europe, but you're on it. Uh, and uh, Christy and uh, Ramin, I want to ask you guys, though. Uh, we've had a lot of set uh, glitches lately. And, mm. you know, we have the whole issue with Spider-Man. You guys are the actors out there every night. These sets are getting bigger and bigger and more complicated. Is there ever a moment where you think, good God, I could be in jeopardy because the technology is so huge on Broadway now? It's a case-by-case -case basis, and this team has always made us feel safe from the very beginning. I think when we first time we got on the train, we ran it so carefully to make sure nobody got hurt and everything was super safe. Our director, Darko Trezniak, was so good about that. I was very yeah. impressed how he put actor safety above everything. Well, Ramin, you've Return been in some tables. of the... You've been in Phantom and Les Mis, yeah. turntables, chandeliers. Yeah. Uh, is it getting out of control to some extent? No, but I've been stuck in that angel a couple times. Oh, and the <laughs> Phantom, Phantom right? Yeah. <laughs> I remember stuck there and it starts swinging and they're like, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a break. I'm like, you're going to take a break? I'm stuck on it. 
Yeah. I got nowhere to go. Like, don't move. I'm like, what do you mean, don't move? I'm not going anywhere. Well, don't miss Anastasia at the Broadhurst Theater, beautiful new musical uh, written by Terrence McNally with Lynn Ahrens and Stephen Flaherty. I'm sorry they couldn't be here to join us, but uh, a lot of new songs. A lot of yes. How many? Only new about songs? four from the movie oh, and. Yeah. Nine or ten brand new ones but the that movie are gorgeous. Songs, the movie songs, people applaud oh, the yeah. movie songs. They're so happy to hear them, and then and, they're wonderful new and songs. And they love the new yeah. songs just yeah. as much, so yes. that's great. Starring Christy Altamar and Ramin Karimlu. We'll see you at um, Anastasia with our tiaras on. Are you the kids, the girls show up with tiaras? Lynn and Steve told me. I've seen they, they all come with tiaras, don't they? Yes. It's adorable. Terrence and McNally, you are now a teen idol. <laughs> Did you ever think? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I say, did I write this show? <laughs> no four-letter words, not, not even partial nudity. And I wrote it. <laughs> All right. Sign of something. Okay, Anastasia at the Broadhurst. Thanks a lot for being our guest tonight on Theater Talk. Thank you. Dancing lips, painted wings, things I almost remember. And a song, someone sings. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.